OK, so today we're going to talk about the movie that we saw last week, a dark song. Oh, that was terrifying. OK, um, so unlike for uh, a text that we read, a movie, um, if we look for evidence, it takes some time and um, Microsoft Teams is not very good with sharing continuous images. So instead, I'm going to ask everyone, including myself, to rely on memory. What can you remember of the movie? And we will talk about the movie based on what we remember. Uh, so I'm not just I'm not going to just talk through all five questions. I'm going to actually ask what you think. OK, so. Uh, the first question, would you trust Mr. Solomon as your guide? Why or why not? Uh, so let's hear first from someone who says yes. Would someone like to share uh, why they would trust Mr. Solomon? Uh, I think Mr. Solomon guide the woman, guide the woman to find the find uh, to uh, to because Mr. Solomon has knowledge. Maybe uh, he can help the woman to uh, to find her son. Mm, OK, so you would trust him as your guide because he has knowledge. He knows how to get there. But how do you know? Because you you asked other people and they said he can do it. Remember at the beginning of the movie, she asks him how many times he has done this. He says twice, but only once successfully. Do you think that's trustworthy enough? 50 percent? Mm, I think in this situation, the, uh, the woman also can say the mother uh, didn't care more about that. He, she just want to see even has only 50%. Mm. So it's better than nothing, basically. Yes. OK, uh, thank you. Um, and would someone here not trust Mr. Solomon? And if you don't trust him, can you explain why not? Yes, <laughs> I won't trust him because. Oh, because of the fact that he said he only did it twice and it only worked once. Ah, and he keeps on emphasizing that this is dangerous. You can't turn back, um, but he says he's only succeeded once. Yes, so because at first I, I don't know. I thought he was maybe just in it for the money. Ah, only in it for the money. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out he also wants something, right? Yes. Uh, do you think you would rather trust someone who is only motivated by money? He, like he or the woman? Uh, the guide. Um, I'm not sure because in the in the beginning it was I was very confused. Like, this is like why why is he doing it because i wasn't sure that he also wanted something in the very very early stage right he says the money is not the issue yes. so why is he doing it right yes yeah but you never know because it, there's always some twist <laughs> yeah and it does seem like an extremely dangerous thing to do simply for money right yes mm. Um, when we learn more about Mr. Solomon, for example, after he seals the house and he commands complete obedience from Sophia, uh, the at the attitude that he presents, uh, would that make you trust him more or less? Uh, I would say less. OK, why? I thought maybe he was just using her. Hmm. But like using her for what? Like just 
because I he looks like a little bit like a creepy guy, so he's like uh, alone and stuff. So I I thought he was just using her like to do everything for him. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, it does seem very uh, um, striking that according to the rules, she has to do all the cooking and cleaning. Yes. Mm. Um, and so this idea of trusting him, are there like are there moments where it seems like, uh, you know, you're right, we should not have trusted him? Now and then when when it still doesn't work, but then it changes when like maybe small things start to happen. Right. So at the beginning, it doesn't like, you know, the bird hits the window. He says it's a sign. Um, could be. Or not, we don't know, right? Yeah. Um, so at the beginning, when Sophia is frustrated that things don't seem to be happening, um, you you would also share that frustration? Yes, because he he's not an expensive service. He's not a cheap service. Yeah, yeah, it does cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then there's also the masturbation scene, right? Where he says he's only a man. Um, and he doesn't tell Sophia this is not part of the ritual until after he finishes. Yes. Yeah, also not very trustworthy. No. Uh, so. Given our feelings about Mr. Solomon, whether you trust him because of I'm, I'm talking to the entire class now, uh, whether you trust him based on his expert knowledge or you distrust him because of his attitude or his lack of communication. When he starts drowning Sophia in the bathtub, what did you think? Did you think he was uh, finally like revealing that he's untrustworthy? Or did you think that he's doing it for a reason? Uh, let's again go with people who trust him first. If you felt like he was drowning her for a reason, can you explain why? Everybody thought he was betraying her. OK, so if you think that if at the moment you thought that he was killing her out of revenge, uh, can you explain why you think that? Maybe Mr. Solomon has his own story. <laughs> uh, mm. Maybe ha because uh, she says she do this ceremony twice. Maybe in the failure this the t uh, failure time he he uh, he kill a people and uh, and also maybe he also do uh, uh, do some do these activities and to and. Uh, kill the person ah yeah this is an interesting question he says we cannot stop once we begin so when he says that he was he failed once before what does that mean to fail if you can't stop and back up like what does failure look like as billy said maybe the client died um or something we don't know Maybe Mr. Solomon took some of the darkness of his first failure into his later attempts, right? It's very uh, unknown, right? Um, and so you're saying for these reasons, uh, when he started drowning Sophia, uh, it looked very, very uh, personal. It didn't seem like it was part of a ritual. Um, on the other hand, there were some clues that he was not. Uh, he was still following some kind of ritual. Uh, on the one hand, after Sophia drowns, he picked up the book again and kept reading, right? He didn't just abandon her or if it was only to kill her, he didn't have to keep reading. Uh, and another clue is that he kept on saying we two are in this together. Nobody can back out. So if he kills her, what happens to him? Right, if they need each other to get through it, 
he can't really kill her. Um, but I think that's a that's a good moment of design by the film where we're not entirely sure whether it's for a ritual or for personal revenge. I thought that was very interesting. Um, and the character of Mr. Solomon himself is also uh, very complex, not entirely trustworthy, but also not entirely like bad. Uh, another reason why uh, we may feel ambivalent about Mr. Solomon is because of his class. Sophia is very obviously of a higher class, upper class. She has the money to rent out a mansion for a whole year, to to increase his salary by 20,000 uh, pounds to, to draw him back in to continue doing the job. She's pretty rich. And her accent is also a very standard British accent. Um, whereas Mr. Solomon's accent is uh, what's known as Cockney, so working class London accent. And when he talks, it's also more direct, more blunt, with more attitude. That tells us that he is from a lower class and also the way that they dress. Um, in the first scene, when Sophia is checking out the house, did you feel like she looked like a witch? She had that long black coat, the very neat collar. It seemed kind of, of a kind of a, a magical outfit to me. Um, but that shows that she's a uh, higher class. Mr. Solomon wears, um, I think it was a polo shirt, and like a. a a, like a plastic jacket, like a windbreaker, a light jacket, like very uh, normal people clothing, not very expensive. Um, so the movie by design, the movie is also asking us about our uh, biases regarding lower class people. It's using that to to try to make us trust Mr. Solomon less. OK, the next question. Uh, let's take this part by part. So what ways do you think the film uses to build suspense? What about fear? What about a sense of the supernatural? Uh, so let's go with suspense. What ways did you notice that the film used to build suspense? I would say music. Music. Yes. OK, what kind of music do you think that was like? What, what kind of feelings did it give you? So that something's going to pop into my face right now. It was very. Um, like in some places it would be very slow before maybe something happens. Um, OK, like it would be that very bassy type of music and then if something happens, it would go like. The, the the tone would be much higher and faster. OK, so uh, most of the time the music is slow, deep. Yes. Uh, and um, because it's so deep, we instinctively feel like it's going to change at any moment because there, there's so much range of sounds that the music could use, but it's only using the deep part. So we're always expecting something to happen and the music to suddenly rise and go very sharp uh, and high and fast. And so that continuous low deep sound creates suspense is what you're saying. Yes, that's okay. what I mean. Good. Uh, what else? Uh, what other ways does the film use to create suspense? Mm, I think it's light. Light, OK, can you explain more? Because in the in the film, uh, they don't uh, they uh, they they close. Uh, uh, I notice they don't usually use the light in the house. They usually maybe uh, because the sun, the, because the uh, uh, window and uh, I know uh, it is uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's morning or it's afternoon. But in the 
evening or night is so it's dark in the house they also they uh, they just burn the fire or just do uh, to uh, to point the candles to uh, to light the house ah right so uh that's right early in the film the power goes out and once they don't have power that means they have to direct the light you can't light everything at the same time and they you they do that using candles as you mentioned um now of course if you try to film someone using only a candle for light you're not going to see a lot so in film what they do is they actually shine a very dim yellow light around the person holding the candle so that the camera can see what's going on um so when you're talking about lighting uh, you're actually talking about two things. One is within the story, what light sources do the characters have? Uh, how how far does that light go? What can they see or not see? But the other thing you're talking about is for the viewer, for the audience, where is there light and where is there no light? How far does the light reach for the camera? which places are kept dark even when there is light. And you're saying that this second part also creates suspense. Um, we are scared of the dark because we don't know what's in the dark. Yeah. Yes, so I'm like in the in the uh, in the final part, final scene, the ghost appear. So we uh, we we just to can see a little more. And uh, to because this is in the dark, uh, uh, dark, uh, dark, dark environment. But we we can uh, we can through the music or shout uh, to guess what happened in the dark. Right. I, I let's talk about that final uh, climax. I think it was very very interesting how it uses light. So after Mr. Solomon dies. Um, Sophia sleeps on her own. She wakes up in the morning and very unusually there's a lot of daylight, right? As you mentioned, most of the time there's not a lot of daylight in the house, even during the day. But that morning the window curtains are open, there's light coming in. And in fact, the, 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 the presence of the light also brings suspense because this is unusual. It's it's something different, and we know that something different means that something's going to happen. Uh, and also because it's a big house and the windows only shine in so far. So yeah, when she first uh, leaves the room she was sleeping in and she walks down the hall, the end point of the natural light is very obvious, right? There's a part of the hallway that is completely dark. Um, and that's also a camera trick. Like if you if you ever been in the place where the sunlight only comes in from one look, uh, angle, you'll see that in fact after the sunlight ends, it's not completely dark, right? It's there's reflection of the sunlight. There's still you're still able to see something, but to the camera, uh, if it focuses on the light, then everywhere there's no light becomes completely dark. So that's a camera trick. Like if you use your phone to take a, a photo and in your photo there is a part that is very bright and a part that is very dark. If you focus on the bright part, the dark parts become completely black. So that's a very good use of the camera trick. And in in fact, it's, it's uh, exactly what happens, right? As soon as she turns to the dark part, there's de uh, demon noises. The demons appear and they drag her down to their basement. Uh, so this is a very interesting and suspenseful use of light here. And you're also talking about uh, in the basement. Uh, because she has been knocked out, she's uh, tied. She's chained to the chair, right? Um, and everything is dark, as you said, and yet we can still see some parts of what is going on. Um, if you notice that part, the reason we're not very clear about what's going on is not because of the light. It's because the camera is 
uh, mimicking Sophia's consciousness coming in and going out, right? She's waking up and fainting, waking up and fainting. So the camera angle is very uh, fragmented. You get a quick shot of this and then it blackens out and you get a quick shot of that and then it blackens out. Um, so that brings us to another way that the film builds suspense, which is using camera, using the camera, using camera angles. This is a classic uh, horror film thing to do. Uh, let me ask you a question. When a character walks into a room, which direction is the camera pointing? Is it pointing the same direction as the character or the opposite direction? Mm, opposite uh, direction. Yeah, usually when a character enters a new space in a regular film, the camera follows the character or even replaces the character to show us what this new space looks like. But in a horror film, the camera will focus on the character. So the new space is behind the camera. And it's a new space. We don't know what's there. So it's incredibly suspenseful while we wait uh, for the film to reveal what is in the new space. At the same time, we see the character's reactions. So if the character is scared, uh, then we know something really terrible is going to happen, right? Um, so this is another way that a horror film will often build suspense by focusing on the character instead of what the character sees. Or a different version of this is when uh, there are a few moments in this movie when Sophia turns a corner and the camera follows her. Usually in a normal movie, in a non scary movie, when a character turns a corner, we immediately get a shot of what is behind the corner. But in a horror film, the camera will follow the character. So again, the character will see what's there before the camera sees it. And that also creates a sense of horror. A sense of suspense, sorry. Uh, OK, thank you. The next part, how did the film create a sense of fear? Uh, different from suspense. Suspense is we're scared because we don't know what's going to happen, or we don't know what has just happened. But what about fear when we know something has happened and it's terrifying? How does the film create that? Any thoughts? I think maybe when some bad things actually start to happen. OK, for example. Um, where there was the part where she heard her son behind the door, and ah. the, the, you didn't you didn't know if it is him or what what is that, and they actually never they never showed it, so you kept on waiting for him to like show up again. Right. So the first time Sophia hears her son's voice through the door, she says, "I know it's not you." But this sentence itself is a paradox. I know it's not you, but you is referring to the person you're talking to. How can the person you're talking to not be the person you're talking to? Um, yeah. So even though she says, I know it's not you, the grammar of the sentence itself creates uncertainty and even fear. Uh, is it her son? Is it not her son? Um, and this and also she keeps saying, I know it's not you, but she continues to have the conversation with the voice, even going so far as to apologize to it. Even though she says she knows it's not her son. So yeah, that is also uh, creates a sense of fear. She's talking to it as if it's her son, but she says and we kind of know that it's not her son. Um, so like what kind of being or what kind of demon has the power to 
use someone's voice, the voice of someone that Sophia cares about the most. How did they find out that she cares about her son the most? And how did they get his voice? Right? All of these things are very scary. Um, and remember at the end of her final conversation with the voice, uh, the voice says, uh, I'm not, uh, they're, they're not my killers. I'm not your son. So the voice confirms that it's not, in fact, her son. And that just makes it scarier. OK, thank you. Uh, other ways that the film creates fear? Think about the moments where you felt scared. Why? Uh, I think the uh, Sophia's songs, uh, his uh, figure, the doll, the small, the small doll movie. Oh, yeah, the little, I think it was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, the small uh, toy. Yes. Mm, small toy. Okay, yeah. why, why did you feel that was scary? Because uh, he, uh, he will uh, appear in any time or uh, suddenly move, uh, moving or falling down, and and it is uh, it like to give uh, Sophia a clue to believe his son appear. Oh. Mm, yeah. So uh, the first time this becomes important in a scary sense is when Sophia can't find it, and Mr. Solomon says he did not take it. So who took it, right? And then when it reappears, it appears on top of a washing machine. And it seems to be moving by itself. But that's also a very uh, precise place to put the toy. Because we know that a washing machine shakes. So is the toy moving because of the washing machine or is it moving for another reason? And then when it falls behind the machine and Sophia can't find it again. And you're saying that this is scary to you because it's it's kind of like uh, something is trying to talk to Sophia about her son. Like they know that she cares about her son, right? And I also think it belongs to the supernatural. Yeah, that is uh, something supernatural as well. Yes. Um, related to the toy, whenever Sophia looked at the picture of her son, I was always terrified that something bad was going to happen to the picture. Like the son, like the, the, her son in the picture might suddenly look at her or like, uh, her son would disappear. <laughs> I really hate horror movies. Um, I have an active imagination. Um, but nothing bad really happened there. Instead, she just tore the picture in half. Uh, I guess to protect her son's half, I guess. I don't know. Not quite sure about why she did that. Um, what other ways does the film create fear? Did you guys notice something else? Uh, so one uh, quick example is when the bird hit the window. I'm pretty sure that scared everybody, right? Uh, there's no warning, suddenly just a, a loud thump, and you saw something black hit the window. And the window is, if I remember correctly, the window is not transparent. It's kind of foggy. You can't see through the window. So something black hits the window, uh, very suddenly and very loudly. Uh, in horror films, we call that a jump scare because it makes you jump. A uh, very sudden, very scary moment. This film doesn't use a lot of that. Most of the scariness of this film is based on suspense and atmosphere. Um, another scary thing is uh, Remember when she refuses to apologize or she refuses to forgive, so Mr. Solomon forces her to drink blood. 
she drinks the blood. And then the scene repeats itself and she has to drink it again. With no explanation. That also was kind of terrifying because it opens up the possibility that she doesn't know how many times she will have to drink the blood. Is it twice? Is it three times? Is it ten times? Um, and it also reminded me of a scene from uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. At the end, remember, if you've seen the movie or if you've read the book, uh, Dumbledore takes Harry to a cave. And in the cave, there's a pool of water with zombies in it. And in the middle of the cave, there's a basin full of liquid that Harry has to force Dumbledore to drink. And no matter how hard Dumbledore refuses, Harry has to keep forcing him to drink. Uh, to me, that I don't know. Like both scenes seem to be terrible in the same way. Um, something else that was scary. Uh, one more example. Remember when Sophia had to leave the? Uh, she decided to leave the house. Um, and when she finally stepped over the line. This is an incredibly important moment, and the film tells us it's important by having her stop in front of the line, and then the camera focuses on her feet, and then she takes one step outside of the line and then stops again. It tells us that she really cares, and we should really care about this important moment. And so that's why when she stepped over the line, I gasped. Um, I can't believe she really did that. After all of Mr. Solomon's warnings, after all the proof that things were actually happening, she still decided to leave. The scary part, of course, is that she walks half the day and then comes back to the same house. Uh, which when Mr. Solomon says uh, if we if we cross the line, we will never escape it. I was thinking more like. The demons will continue to haunt us at night or whatever. I did not expect her to literally be unable to escape it. So that was kind of scary. Uh, and then, of course, at the climax, when they like they cut off her finger. Uh, when demons start appearing everywhere, when they drag Mr. Solomon away. Uh, and also, did you notice the dog? She's being uh, she's tied to the chair and once when she wakes up, she sees uh, the bottom half of a black dog, a big black dog, and there's a growling noise. Uh, that dog is also a sign that she is among demons because remember when she was talking to the voice of her son through the door, her son kept saying there's a dog and it's scary and we also heard dog sounds. So that that uh, the sight of the dog sort of connects these two scenes to show that she has um, basically opened the door now. She has passed through the door. Yeah, I don't know. The entire movie was scary, but those are some things that I felt were particularly scary. Uh, and so the film creates fear um, by doing things that are unexpected things that happen uh, in a way we don't understand and we don't accept uh, expect. Uh, like, I don't know how many uh, protagonists of films you expect to actually have their fingers cut off. Like, especially today when we're used to like, you know, after watching uh, Avengers Infinity War, we kind of expect them to come back to life, right? Uh, today, when we watch movies, it's rare to find something that is actually irreversible, that can't be changed, like a finger being cut off. Uh, so that was shocking and also kind of unexpected. OK, the last part of this question, uh, how did the, the film create a sense of the supernatural? Uh, Billy already mentioned the toy figure moving by itself, appearing, disappearing, which hints that as there's an, another world or another dimension happening at the same time. What other ways does the film use to create a sense of the supernatural? 
Any ideas? Mm, I also remember the glitter down from the city. The do you mean when the flower fell from the ceiling? Yeah, maybe the flower. <laughs> or the, yeah. The, oh, and the glitter. Yeah, and the gold. Yes. Yes. You're right. mm. Uh, the, at first it was flowers, right? And then later on it became gold. And gold is always a symbol of something good. So Mr. Solomon, I think, said something about her guardian angel or something. Uh, yeah, that is very, very supernatural. Uh, and unexpected. Something else? Maybe at the end. Ah, at the end. When the or demons the actually the appeared? Yeah, they're, they're, they also appeared somewhere close to the end, but not really at the end. Uh, like when she returns to the house, right? Yes. And they drag away Mr. Solomon? Yes. I thought that scene was also very interesting because it was not shot in a scary way. It was just sort of like, this is what happened. right? She's sitting on the staircase with a candle. She looks at them dragging him away, and she's like, Eh, OK, I guess that's that. And then she walks back upstairs. <laughs> that was kind of interesting. It shows that she's sort of uh, accepting that this is the situation that she's in. Um, yeah, so the demons and also like the guardian angel at the end, right? That was very supernatural. Um, we'll talk about that in the next question. What else? Uh, are there other ways that the film used to create a sense of the supernatural? Uh, maybe the self uh, in the final part, Sophia, uh, there is a sound and Sophia can hear and Sophia to talk to the uh, to respond to this sound, but didn't know who who say this, who say these words. Mm -hmm. Do you mean when she's talking to her guardian angel or? No, no, the angel is uh, it's maybe a sound from outside the window. Oh, I think I remember this. Um, yeah, I, I I think there was a moment where there was some kind of sound, but uh, I mean, there are lots of moments with sounds, right? There's once when there's a bang from beneath the floor. Uh, and then there's once where uh, she's led into a room and on the wall, there's like a blood mark. That was also a sound, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the, the idea that there are sounds with no source or like through a wall, right? Uh, also a very supernatural thing. And it's not just like bugs. It's someone talking voices. Um, think about the, the beginning when strange things happen and every time something strange happens, Mr. Solomon says it's beginning. It's a sign or like after uh, he revives the drowned Sophia and then they argue and then Mr. Solomon is stabbed by the knife. He says this is her guardian angel taking care of her. Uh, all of these explanations for coincidences. Uh, also hint at that there's something supernatural going on. And then, of course, we have the ritual. The ritual itself is like incredibly supernatural. Um, and also, I don't know if you noticed, but different parts of the ritual seem to come from different cultures. Like there's one part of the ritual where Sophia is writing like uh, East Asian characters on Mr. Solomon's back, like calligraphy. Um, they're not Chinese characters. I don't think they're an actual language, but it looks like it's an East Asian language, right? Uh, yes, I I remember he he writes a Chinese characters. <laughs> yeah, well, it looks yeah. like Chinese characters. Yeah, he, he writes Kung Fu. <laughs> in 
Really? Um, I didn't I didn't notice actual characters. Yeah, it's, a, it's a Chinese character. Yeah. Because I very I very surprised. So I uh I also uh, I copied this picture. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Uh yeah, very it's very interesting what uh, a Western audience might feel to be exotic, strange, or even supernatural. Some other rituals, uh, for example, when he, when uh, at the beginning and they're copying the sacred text, the ritual text, uh, Mr. Solomon is wearing like a brown robe. So that's kind of like a, a, a monk, right? So it's a kind of religious ritual. And then uh, when he's... Uh, Pouring water on Sophia. He's like wearing, I think, blue robes. Uh, so that seems like a different kind of religion or religious ritual. Uh, it to me, like all of the rituals in the movie seem to be a mixture of different traditions. And to me, what that says is it's not a single tradition. Like there's an idea that all religions get things partly right. So like the specifics of each religion are not correct, but the idea that there is another world and that there are higher powers uh, and that it's useful to pray or something like that, though that those ideas seem to be correct. So by combining rituals from different traditions, uh, to me the film is saying that uh, what they're trying to do is not limited to one religion. It's so supernatural that it's even beyond religion. Uh, so like they're not talking about God and the devil. They're talking about guardian angels and demons. Uh, and actually, I don't know if you know this, but the idea of angels and demons is actually older than the idea of God and the devil. People have been believing in angels and demons for a longer time than established religion. Uh, so everything points to like something even. And there's also the idea that um, we have forgotten the wisdom of ancient history. Like the more we focus on our world, the more we have forgotten about the other world. So in fact, uh, there's the idea that the further back into the past that you go, uh, the closer you are to that original supernatural uh, world. So the fact that the movie talks about the older angels and demons and not about God and religion also hints that it is dealing with something even older and more powerful than religion. So that's also a sense of the supernatural. OK, uh, up to this point, do you have questions? No questions? OK, so I'll give you the next question and I'll, uh, we can think about this during the break. OK, so the question three, do you think it would have been better not to see the demons or guardian angel? Why or why not? So you can think about uh, what effect the movie would have had if we never saw the demons or if we never saw the guardian angel. Or you can think about um, how you felt the first time you saw this movie's demons or when we finally saw the guardian angel. And you, you can compare to see whether you would have preferred the effect of not seeing them or whether you prefer to have actually seen them. And uh, let's take a short break. So oh, the question was, do you think it would have been better not to see the demons or guardian angel? Why or why not? So if you think it would have been better not to see them, can you tell us why? Nobody? OK, so if you think it was better to see them, can you tell us why? 
Um, I think it was better to see them because if you wouldn't have seen them, it would have felt like um, I maybe pointless because you were waiting for that throughout the whole movie to like actually see them. Ah, okay. So you're saying uh, if we did not see them, it would feel like it was cheating. Like it kept on hinting that there were demons and a guardian angel, but there's never any proof. So like it feels like like what have we been watching? It's like wasting our time. Yes. Okay, it makes sense. Um, as for not showing the demons and angel, um, there's a way that the character can see these uh, supernatural beings, but the camera does not. So we can have shots of Sophia seeing the demons. Uh, we can have a shot of Sophia seeing her guardian angel. Uh, but we, the viewers, may not have to see them. And one way that this could be uh, more effective than having us actually see them is that uh, imaginations are always more powerful than reality. So if we can get confirmation from the character that they actually do see demons and the angel, then we ourselves could imagine what those supernatural beings look like. And whatever we imagine could be vastly more terrifying than what we actually see. Because what do we actually see? The demons are half naked, dirty, uh, wounded, sick. So, you know, basically there are a lot of elements here that are taken from uh, like older societies or older civilizations, uh, pre-modern civilizations, or even um, indigenous cultures or rural cultures today. So there's already a bias there for uh, a sort of distaste or disgust at uh, older cultures or more indigenous cultures that is built into the design of the demons. Um, and, you know, they're, the fact that they still look so human to me makes them less terrifying. So for the demons, I think personally it would have been more effective if we never saw a clear image of what they look like. Uh, who says demons have to look like humans, right? Uh, as for the guardian angel, again, it seemed too uh, human. Like, uh, I was expecting something that looked more uh, inhuman, otherworldly, like an actual angel. Like, um, I don't know if you know this, but in the Bible, angels are not human. They don't look like humans. Uh, some angels are described as having 10 eyes. Some angels are described as like a sphere or like a, uh, a cylinder. Uh, the idea that angels are humans is part of pop culture, not a part of like these actual religious traditions. So I was expecting something like uh, pure light, like a, a ball or source of light, which is kind of like what I thought was going to happen based on the light that shined into the basement. Or I was expecting like a uh, something more biblical, like a ball of fire, right? Or like a burning bush, uh, which is taken from the Bible. But no, the film gave us the literal definition of a guardian angel, a bigger, like shinier guy in armor because he's a guardian. Uh, I thought that was actually kind of stupid. Um, but at least the film did not let us hear what the angel was saying, because as we know, angels and God speak in, in, in their own angelic language. So Sophia is not supposed to, she, she, it, it makes sense that she understands him directly, not through language. Um, okay, so that's the two sides of this question. 
the the pros and cons of seeing the supernatural beings. Question four. Do you think Sophia gets what she wants at the end? Why or why not? So what do you think? If you think Sophia does get what she wants at the end, uh, can you tell us why? I think uh, Sophia finally, uh, she wants to free herself from the uh, from her son's death. Mm. Mm, and but I think she didn't get what she want at the end. But uh, in my opinion, I think she wants uh, someone accompany with her. So after the Mr. Solomon die, uh, no nobody nobody can accompany with Sophia. So mm. he uh. He get the um, uh, I think he uh, he get uh, he feel free, but he also feel frustrated after the ceremony. Ah, OK, so you're saying that she actually wants more than one thing. She says that she wants revenge, but by revenge, she actually means she wants closure. She wants to be able to move on from her son's death. But on top of that, you're saying she's she misses her son also because she is. She needs someone to accompany her. She's kind of lonely for a, an intimate connection. Uh, and this is something that she does not get. Remember at the beginning when she was still lying to Mr. Solomon, she says that she needs to hear her son's voice again. So you're right, th that could be an element of loneliness. Um, and sh that part is not, she doesn't get a solution to that by the end. Um, I mean, symbolically, maybe she does, right? When she sees the guardian angel, her reaction is, it's so beautiful. And beauty can also be a kind of company. Or the feeling of beauty, the feeling of pleasure can also keep you company. So that memory uh, could still be part of her. Like uh, every time she looks at her broken finger, uh, she re will remember what happened, uh, both the good and the bad. So like, She's not entirely alone. She knows that there, there's another world, that there's a guardian angel looking over her. But in terms of human connection, yeah, she does not get that from the journey. Uh, OK, and for people who think she does not get what she wants, why? I don't think she doesn't get what she wants, but I think maybe she gets what she needs. Ah, OK, so you're talking about she says she wants revenge. But what she needs is to be able to move on, and we know that uh, revenge, it does not necessarily solve the problem. What she really needs is forgiveness, the power to forgive. Yes, for like her uh, and the other people. Right, right. OK, I think that makes sense. Uh, OK, other ideas about this question? Did you see the twist coming? Or did you think that she, even at the very end, did you think that she would still ask for revenge? I don't think so. I think because she changed, she like um, too much had to happen to her to still have the same mindset. Ah, right. Um, I think there were a number of hints uh, that maybe her final request would not be revenge. First of all, the movie tells us uh, she says she cannot forgive. So that seems like something that the movie would deal with. How many people in your life have you met who said, I cannot forgive? That seems kind of weird. Um, but also, 
as Brittany, you mentioned, she goes through so much uh, that by the time she reaches the end, her understanding of what it means to punish and to damn someone to hell has taken on new detail, new understanding. And it's hard to imagine anyone who has been through hell like that would wish hell on anyone else, no matter what terrible thing they did. And also, um, when she finally tells the truth to Mr. Solomon, Mr. Solomon says that the murderers will be damned anyway, so she's wasting her wish. Uh, this also seems like uh, it weakens the desire for her to make a wish of revenge. Uh, and then finally, the last point is just as she meets the guardian angel. Again, she says it's so beautiful. She, it's so beautiful she can barely speak. How could she wish for something terrible like revenge when faced with something that's so beautiful? At that moment, I knew for sure that she would not wish for revenge. Uh, like it, the the idea here is that meeting such beauty face to face forces you to tell the deepest truth of yourself. As we talked about in the previous question, the deepest truth is not that she wants revenge. She wants to move on. And only forgiveness can do that because forgiveness changes yourself, not the other person. All right, so she says, I want, I want. I think that moment she's struggling between what she thinks she wants and what she actually wants, as Brittany, you were saying. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, last question. Do you think this story works best as a horror film? Why or why not? If not, what type of film would work better? Uh, OK, so if you think this is uh, this idea works best as a horror film, can you explain why? I think yes, it works. It's anything that has like demons and afterlife in a scary way, and it should be portrayed as a horror film. Mm, right. Okay. If they maybe if they change the music, it can maybe be like a drama, but I don't. I mean, then they. I don't think they have to show the actual people. Right. Uh, so you're saying because of all the supernatural elements uh, and because Sophia is someone who is not familiar with those elements, so she walks in scared. Uh, so making it a horror film puts us in the same position as, as Sophia. And it, it really pulls the film together and makes it about one person's experiences. Uh, OK, and for people who think maybe another kind of film would work better for this story, can you give an example? Mm, uh, I think it's a kind of a suspense film. It's not not totally uh, not totally horror. Uh, okay, so I think you're talking about a thriller. Yes, yeah, thr thriller. Yeah, so the difference is a thriller, uh, a horror film is supposed to make you scared. A thriller is supposed to make you excited yeah. and energetic. <laughs> mm. So you you think that this movie would work better as a straightforward thriller film? Uh, maybe because it's it's a journey. It's a and, journey. Mm. Right, and Mr. Solomon said it's a journey. Oh, uh, so maybe it's two people working together and facing different challenges. That seems like a thriller, right? Yes. Uh, OK, and then of course, uh, every good action thriller near the end, something goes wrong. And it's a and the, the film could have dealt with that crisis in a faster pace, right? To make us feel excited about what's going to happen next. And I also think uh, this film puts some uh, 
human some relative uh, into the film. It's not totally horror, and it uh, it tells some uh, some like teachers say forgive uh, forgiveness, and the mm, and uh, I think Sophia want to protect herself, so he uh, choose she choose lying at her. Right. So you you're saying that. Uh... It's not a straightforward horror film that just wants to scare you. It's also about a human story at the center, yes. including the story between Sophia and herself as well. Um, so th you're, I think you're saying you're agreeing with Brittany that this could also have been a drama. Like uh, if the film focused less on the scary parts and sort of like accepted that this is the kind of world they are in, and focused more on the human emotions, it could have become a drama. Yes, can to uh, uh, to and to make the to make the em, to make the emotion uh, more st uh, strong. Right, right. To focus more on the human emotions. Yes. Okay. Um, and there are films like that where the world itself is supernatural and fantastic, but it's shot as a drama emotionally, not a scary film. Um, the reason I ask this is because actually horror films have become more and more popular recently in the West uh, because p uh, directors have started rediscovering the social importance of horror movies. So not just how you scare the audience, but what is this movie actually about? Uh, because we know that in order to scare someone, you have to make them care about something first. And the, the best way to make someone care about something is to make them care about a character. What the character is feeling, what the character is doing, uh, what their situation is like. And uh, more and more horror films are focusing on the situation part. Uh, treating horror as an allegory or a comparison for something that is scary in the real world. For example, the movie Get Out, Tao Chu Jue Ming Zhen, takes the situation of a black man in a white man's world and focuses on all the parts that are scary about it to make a horror film. Um, so horror has has the the uh, more um, artistic horror films have more and more focused on what makes it scary and not just the scary what the scary parts are, but why are they scary? Um, there's another horror film called uh, It Follows. I don't know the Chinese title. Let's check. I actually want to know what the Chinese title is. Um, is the Get Out one the one where it's about the teacup and like yeah oh. yeah that one uh okay it follows Ling Bing. uh so this story is um there so someone is cursed and to get to die a horrible death and the only way they can escape this curse is if they pass it on to someone else uh but if that someone else dies because of the curse, then the curse will come back to the earlier person. So if I'm cursed and I pass it on to A, and then A passes it on to B, and the curse kills B, then the curse will kill A next. And if the curse kills A, then it will next it will kill me. Here's the thing. The curse can only be passed on by having sex. So we see that this story is not just about a curse, it's also about sexual diseases. Uh, and also about the different kinds of like uh, psychological effects of, of having sex with someone. The kind of physical connection that it creates between two people. Uh, because if again, if you have if I have sex with A and the curse kills A, that means the curse will kill me next. So it's in my interest to keep A alive. In fact, it's in my interest to help A have sex with someone else. 
So the I, the act of sex creates a sec, uh, a physical bond uh, as well. So we can see how this kind of horror movie is not just scary. It also is talking about something and that makes it even scarier. Uh, because like the next time you think about sexual diseases, you might think about this kind of curse, something like that. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in like films as an artistic uh, medium, as a kind of art, then uh, I highly encourage you to look into some of the better horror films of the past five years. And that's why even though they scare the fuck out of me, I still sometimes watch horror movies because they're so interesting. OK, uh, so those are the five questions about the movie. Do you want to ask me something about the movie? Do you have questions about the movie? Yes, I have a question. Sure. Um, why did you choose this specific movie? Uh, I heard it was good. And also, um, I'm also kind of interested in like that kind of supernatural element. I thought that would be interesting. Oh, OK, thank you. Sure. Uh, OK, other questions? OK, then uh, let's look at the final exam. Uh, 